All right, I see some people filtering in. Welcome, welcome. Um, let's go ahead and kick some stuff off. So I've got a couple of administrative items. If you've been to these webinars before, you know the drill. I'm gonna go through a couple of those items and then we're gonna get into the conversation uh, real quick. So um, today we are having a second fireside chat with Lori Silverman. This is a follow-up event from the first one that we had on May 20th. It was one of our best webinars, most engaging webinars, and it was so good that we wanted to do a part two to answer any questions that we didn't get to. Um, so we are recording this. The uh, recording will be available after the fact, so you can share it with your colleagues. Um, but use today as we have Lori to engage with her and ask her more questions if you didn't get them into her beforehand. All right, so quick agenda. I'm gonna do some quick intros. Um, we'll thank our sponsors, Hex Technologies. Then we'll get into the discussion. It says Q&A with the audience at the end, but please just throw your questions in as you, as you think of them, and then we will work them into the conversation throughout. And then, uh, of course, some closing remarks. Um, we've got some announcements from the women in analytics side, and uh, I'll tell you how to access that recording. So just an overview, um, women in analytics does an event series, a webinar series every quarter. We do a six event series on a particular topic, um, and they're every other Wednesday um, for an hour at the same time. Uh, it's open to anybody. The series is free and, and accessible online. A little bit about women in analytics, if you are new. Uh, to this organization um, or haven't heard of us before. We exist to increase visibility of women making an impact in this space. Um, we did just launch our brand new membership platform. Um, it is, we're, we've moved over our platform, so it's a lot more engaging. It's a lot easier to navigate. Um, so check it out. It's at community.womeninanalytics.com. It's free to join. Um, we'll put all of our events in there. You'll get reminders for those. Um, we have a resource center, job board, and um, ways to actually connect with individuals like Lori uh, personally. A big thank you to Hex Technologies for sponsoring their The Data Workspace for Teams. Um, check them out uh, at our um, website. I'll send in the follow-up email to this webinar for everybody that registered, I'll send the link to that and you can check them out. And then a couple of tips, if you're having audio issues, um, send an email, send a chat. Uh, and like I said, Q&A, uh, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom. Go ahead and put your questions in there, or you can send a chat as well. We'll be monitoring both. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to do a quick intro of Lori. If you weren't here for the last one, uh, we'll just do a quick intro of her. Um, like I said, this is a follow-up from the last conversation that we had on May 20th. Uh, it, it was one of our most engaging webinars that we've had. And I think it's mainly because Lori put so much work into engaging the attendees and, and making sure that we're answering all of your questions. Um, she, uh, so for those of you that weren't with us, let me introduce her real quick. So in some ways, she is just like us. So she's managed statisticians and several organizations that helped others make better use of data in their daily work. She's facilitated numerous functional teams trying to find insights in their data, and she's helped spearhead data quality projects. On the other hand, she's kind of not like us at the same time. Um, for 40 years, Lori has consulted across 25 industries helping C-suite leaders fully transform their enterprises, which means culture change is her sweet spot. She also teaches master's level courses in organizational development and strategic thinking for Golden Gate University, both of which she believes are critical for us to learn. Um, her comments may cause you to take a pause since they're outside of the mainstream thinking in the analytics community, but I guarantee you will walk away from this webinar with something useful to help you in your everyday activities and, and decision making. So we've designed today's session to use questions that Lori collected in advance. So thank you so much if you did give her questions ahead of time. And like I said, we'd love to address yours throughout the event as well. So please add them in the Q&A or the chat box and we will definitely get along the way. So let's kick things off um, with one of the first uh, questions that we got. Um, and this is just kind of a general question as well. So how can we help leaders see that they could use some help with decision-making, especially at companies that may see analytics teams as like slowing them down? Um, and so here's a specific example that we can dive into. 
So imagine a meeting where sales and customer service and marketing are talking about a lack of a single source of truth. And I know everyone's been there before um, for measuring account health. Um, they discuss the misalignment and tracking account performance and how to gain alignment when the one person subjectively feels something is good and another feels it's bad. Um, that they then start talking about the possibility of using an account scorecard, which um, we suggested leveraging data such as performance metrics like usage and other KPIs that they track as inputs to building a scorecard. Um, this individual is met with pushback that account health should be more decided by qualitative factors. So how do you navigate that kind of a conversation in a meeting setting like that where so many people are disagreeing on what these insights should be to help them make decisions? Um, and I wanna make my response responses within still the context of us talking about how do you create a culture that supports embedding analytics into day-to-day -day activities. Um, this is a really rich example. And what I wanna talk about first um, is a communication style perspective that I often observe. And that is when this person said, I think we should lever leverage data such as performance metrics, usage and other sorts of things, they made what I would refer to as a declarative statement. That's not always received well in a meeting setting because other people in the room are gonna look at you like, well, who are you to tell us what it is that we need to do? Because you're not a part of our functional area and we're having a conversation about what's going on in our function. And so what I suggest you do is switch from what I'm calling an advocacy approach, which is making a statement about something to inquiry and to um, seeking to understand. So I, I, to me, when you do that and you start asking questions of curiosity, you demonstrate empathy and you demonstrate that you have a keen interest in getting inside their mindset. Because until you completely understand why they're saying what they're saying, and they trust you, they're not gonna listen to you. And so one of the real challenges I think is that we try to fight facts, like these people said these things with facts. That's called persuasion. Persuasion rarely works. The only time it ever works is if someone really likes you, they care about you, they care about the topic, there are no distractions and they're really paying attention. But 99.9 .9 times out of 100, you can't use techniques like that because it comes across as being too strong. So I'm not surprised at the response that the person got. So that's kind of the, what I'm gonna call the communication side of it. And, and we may talk more about influence a little bit later today. Um, now, in terms of the content itself, with the person saying we need to leverage data such as performance metrics or KPIs that we already have, um, I wanna use this as a teachable moment. That's not, a decisioning approach to the conversation. So last time when we had this webinar, I talked about needing to make a mindset shift from talking about the data to talking about decision making. This person fell into what the group was doing, which was talking about the data. I would have pulled back. Me personally, I would have pulled back and I would have said something like, I am curious, um, how do you plan to use the information that would come out on the scorecard? Or what sorts of problems or issues would you be trying to address if we actually put a scorecard together? So I'd be taking it away from the data itself and the conversation on qualitative versus quantitative or KPIs and things like that, and trying to take it back to the big picture to say, so what? So what, why even do this in the first place? But I would do it in a way that was kind and gentle to the situation so that I have a greater chance of people listening to me um, rather than coming across as though I know what they should do. Does that make any sense to you in terms of your experiences, Reagan? Absolutely. I find um, the, there can be kind of a perception of like analysts or data scientists that, you know, um, they speak in very uh, in terms that are, like you said, factual, like we're talking in a very matter of fact way. And there's this kind of perception that they know best or they know all and they they know better than me, except I'm the subject matter expert. And there's typically a lot of tension there, especially when they're trying to 
or when they find some sort of insight that might combat what that person had originally kind of thought about. So to your point, that relationship, starting off that conversation of like on your team, I want to understand exactly what's going on in your business. You know, that's where I've seen the most success and the best acceleration in the beginning to get to an under, a, a common understanding of the problem that you're solving truly. And I know that can be really hard and ambiguous to talk about. Do you have any advice on how to like formalize that? Or um, is there any kind of structure that you would recommend people use in those moments? Well, um, there's a couple of things I wanna talk about from a communication perspective, and then I'll come back to the decision-making perspective. I think it's always coming with an open mind to the conversation and um, having some of these questions even that you're thinking about in advance. What is it that you don't know? What is it that you're trying to get out of this meeting? What would be helpful for others to hear questions about that would get them to step back and do a little bit of thinking? But even when you ask the questions that I've proposed, people will likely come out with different responses. Your job is not to say which is right or wrong. It's to say, I'm hearing a couple of different comments here and help me to understand how you see them all fitting together. It's continuing that exploration of curiosity. Now I do that even with C-suite leaders in the room. And I know in this particular situation, I believe the CEO is here. The reason I'm doing it is because the CEO is gonna pick up on that almost automatically. People in the room may not, but you have to think about who it is that you're communicating to and what are you trying to role model? And to me, what you're trying to role model is that I'm here to help. I'm not here to tell, I'm here to help. I'm here to facilitate. I'm here to help you get what you need in order to move further. Now, from a decision-making perspective, and so I have a question for everyone who's on the call right now. Who that's listening in today in your organization has a formalized approach to collaborative data-informed decision-making that's documented so that I could go into a room, and this is mine, so I'm just going to show it. And anybody who wants, just give me a ring and I'll... Um, uh, I'll send you this and I have a couple of things I can send you as well. But this is the model that we created. It's called Smarter. And it's a model that we created back in 2015 and we've been developing over time to say, here's a method for doing decision-making. So when I come into meetings like that, where I am and where this person is, is in seeking context, which is the first step that's here. That's the S in Smarter, which is in seeking context. And this is where I think people get confused. It's not an analytic step. It's a strategic thinking step. It's an opening step. It's trying to get as much information as I can. It's not trying to close down. Once we start talking about the data, which is step number two, manage the data, then we can start to, we're starting to do some analytical thinking. But we've got to start out at a much different place um, from a more strategic perspective. And I think that's a piece that yeah, I don't often see because we get caught up. But when you have a methodology like this, and I've been teaching this method now, as I said, since 2015, then we can say, well, where are we on this? Where is our conversation on this? And who do we need to involve at each of these steps along the way? For those of you who'd like to learn more, I, um, last year, I have a, a show called Level Up with Lori. It's a LinkedIn Live show. Episode 10 that we did, and you can find it on YouTube, talks about this framework that we have. Um, because I think it's so important for people to have something to talk at rather than point at. Because when you don't have a methodology like this, I'm going to point at you and you and you and you. When we have something like this, we can say, well, have we done all the steps here? I think this is where we are. What are all the steps that are in seeking context? What are all the things we need to do? So now we're pointing at a sheet of paper and we're talking about this, and this is where we can have our conversations rather than making them interpersonal and often conflicting. So to me, and I don't see anyone responding here, um, uh, it, it, maybe you do on your end. Um, I'm really curious. I don't think, I, every time I keep asking, do you have a methodology like this? I get consultants who have what I'm going to call um, uh, frameworks, but maybe not as in-depth as the one that we've been putting together because we've spent so much time really thinking through, you know, different types of insights. Where does intuition fall in? Where does strategic thinking fall in? Where does storytelling, business storytelling fall in? Not data storytelling, because I, I personally have a, 
a lot of issues with data storytelling as someone who's written three books on business storytelling. Um, and, and that just has to do with that the human brain doesn't really care for data. It's going to shut down. That's a persuasion technique. It's not an influence technique. Story, true human story is, a, is an influence technique. So this is what I think about too with that person who was in that meeting. Where were they on this? And they may have left, leapt over the first step and we can't, but if you don't have a methodology drawn out in your organization, then I wanna know how you're gonna have any consistency in these conversations. I, I don't know about you, but yep. it means to me, if I put like, um, you know, five, five data analysts in a room and I say, what's your methodology for decision-making and they were to outline them, they're all gonna outline them differently. And that becomes problematic. Absolutely. And if anybody does have, once they're working on, throw them in the chat. Uh, I see a couple people already contributing, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and I saw that, you know, someone had mentioned it's tough, it's challenging. What are the biggest challenges you're experiencing in developing that methodology it might be good to throw into the chat as well. Um, and, and Lori, to your point, there's a couple of things that you touched on that I just resonate so much with. So the first thing is um, this idea that we're there to not tell the answer, but to tease out the answer. Mm -hmm. And and I tell every an data and analytics team, it is not our job to determine what's right. It's our job to bring more information to the surface so that people can come to the same conclusion. Right. And so to your point, like ask those questions where you're like, what does this mean? Does everybody agree with that? And if they have all different answers, we've got something that we need to come like coalesce around now. And it's our job to kind of ask those good questions, bring them up. Um, to the surface that so we can get on a, on the same page of context. The other thing you brought up was this consistency piece. We're trying to optimize decision flows. That's our job as an analytics team. We're looking at the decisions being made by the business and we're trying to optimize those decisioning processes. So if you don't have a consistent way of making decisions, you know, it, this is the industrial systems engineering, you know, engineer coming on me, but like you have to stabilize before you optimize something. You have to have consistency to understand where the most optimal points to go after for optimization exists. And so to your point, like if everybody's doing it different, it's going to be really hard to show progress and it's going to be really challenging to have these conversations. Yes, absolutely. And I want to come back. There's a point that was made in the chat here, which is the biggest challenge is getting involved at the strategic point. The company doesn't view the analytics team as a strategic partner. We're just seen as a support function. And wow. That is a significant issue, especially for those of you who are setting up new departments. Oh my gosh, if you are not doing true organization design work at that point, and you're just saying, oh, we're gonna put five people into a department and see what happens. And you're not lobbying to be a part of those strategic conversations, you're, you're gonna be in a sorry state later on. But the second piece is by asking questions, you can ask strategic questions. Nobody's ever gonna stop you from doing that. But what they might stop you from doing is making strategic statements, because again, you're not, you are that support function. So how, who are you to know? But if I ask questions and I bring out the right sorts of information from the right sorts of people in the room and people start to have their own ahas and realizations, that's huge progress. And so to me, a methodology um, like this, which goes from the way, for the way from setting context to managing the data, to assuring confidence in the data. And by the way, there's like 20 steps under each of these to talking about revealing different types of insights to taking a stand, which is, means making a decision, executing the decision, and then um, relaying the results. So it goes all the way through the entire continuum of decision-making. And oftentimes what I find with analytics groups at best, they're focused on the first two or three, they might even get to insights, but it could be a handoff. And the challenge is if you don't have the right context up front and the right questions to be answered, you're not going to find meaningful insights. And if you don't have meaningful insights, I don't care what stories you tell people, those stories aren't gonna relate back to the problem that people had in the first place. And so you, you have to have a methodology that shows the relationship between each of these pieces. And for those of you who say you're having a, a problem with putting together methods like this, I after the last call, I did a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that ran over an hour each. And I'm fine to do those with you because it's just to me as a giving back to the community to really talk through how do you either take a methodology that exists and tweak it and make it yours within your organization or how do you create one from scratch? I'm going to tell you something. For us though, it took us a good five years 
you know, of adding a lot of different pieces and points and me teaching thousands of people and hearing their questions about the use of the methodology to come up with what we have today. Because it takes that much feedback, right? You know that from your, from your industrial background. It takes that much feedback to say, okay, how have we honed this now to actually make it user, usable? Yeah, it's interesting you say this first piece of context and, and the, the pain point that they said of like not being in the room during the strategic conversations. I hear that all the time. I talk to tons of CDOs constantly. I'm like, what's the biggest problem you're having today? It is strategic alignment. They'll go door to door, knocking on doors, trying to build relationships with business owners. Um, and saying, hey, we can do these things. I can help you. How can I help you? What's the biggest problem you're having? I mean, this is the number one problem that I've been hearing um, from these data and analytics leaders. Well, and, and so what you're pointing out are two different things. What those people are doing is they understand that there are two primary influence techniques. Likeability, which means I trust you and your group. And if I don't know you, I don't like you but there's a lot of other elements to likability too. Like for someone like me, I tend to like smart people. I mean, and, and I, I mean that's kind of crass, right? Because it's like, well, what if somebody comes up to you and doesn't seem so smart? I'm quite dismissive. And that's not good, but that's just my personality temperament. And so if you're working with someone like that, you may have to prove that you're smart before you can do anything, right? And, and, and that doesn't mean smart related to, to working on a project with them. It could be something else that you say, like if I'm working with C-suite leaders, oftentimes it's a question I ask and they go, ooh, that woman's smart. I would never have thought of that question, right? The second influence technique that they're using is reciprocity. And what they understand about reciprocity is that you have to give and give and give and give without getting anything in return. How can I help you? What can we do? Where can we, you know, where, where are you having heartache right now? What sorts of chronic problems haven't you been able to solve that we might be able to assist with? And continuing to have those conversations and building those relationships over time. If you do not have those two pieces, you can't do the rest of this. And I think that's what people are missing is that you have to, you have to know people, you have to know what they can do um, to help you and your group, and you have to know what you can do to help them. You're talking a lot about influence, and I think that's one of the key pieces here. We got lots of questions on this topic that kind of surround surrounded this, this idea of influence and how, how it's critical for, for analytics initiatives to be successful. Whose job is this in an organization? Whose job is it to do what? To, to build that influence and gain traction. Like whose every job single, is it? Every single person. Uh, but I think there's a different question that I, would, that I thought you might ask. That's why I asked for clarification. Who owns this? I think is an even more critical piece. Who owns the decision-making approach and process? And who's gonna put it together? I have not to this day seen a job description where ownership for this has been in anybody's job description or an analytics team that's had this as a statement of a role and responsibility. Now, how sad is that? So I think we've got a different issue. You can go out and build the relationships, but then if you can't do the follow through and if you don't know how to approach these projects in a systematic manner, like this, this may not work for your organization, but I mean, gosh, I've taught it as far away as South Africa to people and it's been usable. I mean, in different cultures. So I, I think it's just a matter of putting something on paper and then saying, here's the process we're gonna go through and we'll add steps to it as we go through it. Um, there's someone who just um, made a comment here to us who said pinch points. We have few people who are strategic thinkers. And by the way, that's true. That's um, only about, 12 to 15% of the population is innately strategic in their thinking. Okay, I just happen to be one of those people, um, which is why we have to teach strategic thinking skills. Um, I'm gonna this uh, fall for the first time in quite some time do a public workshop on strategic thinking um, uh, in DC, um, because I think that that need is becoming apparent again uh, for people. Um, few people trained or interested in organization management. And I add to that in organization development. I, 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 I'm going to come back and, and really hone in on this because the questions I saw this time show to me that if, if you could go and get a certificate in anything, get a certificate in organization development. 
I mean, I know that's going to sound weird, but there are few people in organizations who are able to do the work that you and I are talking about today. Now, I did, um, after the last webinar, I got an email from a guy in the UK, and bless his heart, his organization has someone like me internal who's helping them. And he said to me, as he went through all the things that they were doing, he said, it's painful because it's not the way most of us think. But that's why you need someone. You've got to find that resource inside your business who can help you or find an external resource that you can bring in and who will help you attend to that organization management. But um, I would also say to you, Reagan, when you think about the CDOs you've worked with, in whose job description is that piece? You know, that I'm, resp that I'm responsible for that as well. Not just the decision making, but the design of how the organization is going to flow going forward to embed analytics. I, I don't see that either, do you? Nope, I don't. And I've asked the question, because unfortunately these individuals are both tasked with designing these things, testing them, rolling them out, and building all of the analytics solutions and managing those. And so they've got a million roles. And they can't focus because I've asked, I asked point blank one of them. I'm like, whose job is that? He said, mine. Oh, okay. In addition to all of these other things that you're doing. Um, and so it, it's, it, I'm sure it's just one of the things that it's like, oh, it's not urgent. I haven't, I have to get this dashboard out in front of this executive um, because that's one of the metrics, kind of vanity metrics our team is um, evaluated against. How many models have we built? How many models are being produced and in production and people are using? And I think that's the problem is that one, training and development are on the back burner at always. They're the first, it's the first thing to get cut. And two, again, these kind of critical foundational kind of design elements of decisioning are also deprioritized. Well, in decisioning and how to transform the organization, um, I'm going to say stealthily, uh, because that's what we're talking about here, right? You know, it's not going to be an overt change transformation initiative, but how to do that stealthily is that that's nobody's responsibility. And if it's nobody's responsibility, it isn't going to happen if it's the leader's responsibility and they've got 500 things on their plate and they don't have a resource that they can turn to for assistance, it's not going to happen either. And so therein, I think, lies our gap is who, who is going to take that on? That's my question to all of you. Who's going to take this on? We are going to continue to have project failures. I mean, I just saw a webinar. You and I were talking a little bit about this yesterday, Reagan, about, you know, I mean, why is it that data outputs aren't being, you know, adopted as quickly? And why is there so many problems? Everybody's talking about this from 25 different angles. And it's like, I, and I keep saying, well, when are you going to get the resource that's going to help with that? When are you going to get the resource who has the knowledge to help with that? Because if you all think you can do it from an analytics mindset or a data mindset, probably not going to happen as effectively as you need. And you're going to have these failures. So at some point in time, I think we need to pause. We just need to pause and say, when am I going to go get these skills or who are the people who can help us within the enterprise? Now, to me, um, there are some really well-trained BAs out there who can truly assist with this. And the IBA has been working, I've been working with them a lot on how do we position BAs to also help with this culture shift, as well as the setting the context piece at the front end of projects and what I'm gonna call the business storytelling influence piece that comes when we're sharing the insights that we have um, with others because to craft really good narrative stories is a challenge. I think that's why so many data visualization software packages have appeared on the market because they're easy. But as soon as you go back to the data, you're missing, you're missing that part of the brain, the unconscious part of the brain where decisions are made. Decisions are not made in the conscious brain. They're made in the unconscious brain and they're made with feelings. Yeah, and, and you mentioned BAs. I, I've seen this transition because I think a lot of people are so focused on reporting and dashboarding and those types of you know, solutions that they're building, right? Okay. And, and now we're seeing a shift of people building products, right? Internal products, AI products. Right. So a lot of, I've seen a lot of companies change their 
terminology of what you're calling a BA, which is essentially like business process analysis and understanding where insights would be inserted to product management, which is like user research, pro like managing the design of the product, ensuring that it's successful in some capacity. Um, any thoughts on that kind of change in terminologies or difference? Well, we're all grabbing at straws to try to solve a core issue. Um, and there's, there seems to be this bias that if we move away from project management to product management, then we'll have more successes. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced because it's like, you, 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 you can't, it's, it's kind of the adage, which is crass. You can't put lipstick on a pig and call it something different, right? I mean, it's still a pig. And so I think therein, therein lies the dilemma. You can call it anything you want, but are you getting the work done that you and I are talking about? Is it happening? Because if it's not happening, then we still are gonna have the same sorts of issues and problems. Um, but yes, product management is, um, a whole um, a set of um, themes within the IIBA community as well this year. Bringing more. Yeah, back. that's interesting. Yeah. That's super interesting. There is a question that came up. I need a little bit more background information from the person who gave it. Maybe they can elaborate. Um, who's, they said, I'm an R&D in a large national operational program, and there's a constant divide between operations and development, how to make this bridge more functional and synergistic. Um, I need a little bit more on that. Um, my, my first reaction to it is, it's divided because it's divided up front. And this is the exact same issue that analytics folks have where I'm not invited to the table right away. See, to me, when I'm doing work and I'm trying to solve a really challenging issue and I'm using this methodology, what I'm thinking about is who are the resources along the way that need to be involved and how do I involve them all up front? Because if, if I involve them, we get to a, a middle piece of this and I'm gonna hand this something off to you Oh, I was looking at this data and now I need you to create some data visualizations that I can put into a PowerPoint slide and I can show my boss, blah, blah, blah. They don't know what the question was that you were asking up front. They don't know what you're trying to emphasize. I mean, I've even seen people have questions online going, well, it might not be the right colors. It might not be the right, who cares? It's like, where, was, where were you involved up here, up front? Do you even know what it is that you're trying to work with? And oh, by the way, once you get those data visualizations done, they're merely still observations. They're not telling me insights. Where are the insights? Who's working? Whose responsibility is it to get to insight? That true aha. And so my, my first reaction um, to the person whose question is, because I don't have a lot of background here, is to say, well, it's divided because maybe the team is divided up front. You know, we only involve certain people along the way because, oh, we don't want to have too many people joining in right away. Um, the person said, um, I work for the US Forest Service and we collect a huge amount of data from field plots a year, but are science driven. Okay, so to me, this is like a perfect opportunity for something like this. I mean, because until you have a methodology with which to join people around in terms of decisioning, so you have science. I'm, I'm, I, I can't be more specific than that because I don't have a lot of specificity here. Um, and I'm happy to talk offline about this. Um, and I've worked, I've done a lot of government work um, with groups that are more science and experimental um, related, or we have to go back to what the research says. Again, that's all fine and good, but what are we, what are we trying to solve? What are the decisions we're trying to make? How are we trying to move the business forward? And I, that's where, it, that's the gap I think to operations. Yeah, I agree. I, actually, if you, if you go back to the first webinar of the series, um, we sat down with uh, two women and talked about the phases of building advanced analytics solutions. And the conclusion overwhelmingly, and Jaya mentioned this as one of the speakers, overwhelmingly was the build is the smallest part. Like we used to obsess over, okay, we got to have Jupyter in a book and we've got to have Python and like all of these different technical nuances of building these things, but it has now become the most, the easiest part, <laughs> which is crazy. It's like the two end points or the end, end caps of this process, which is this upfront piece we're talking about, which drives the requirements for the rest of it. If you do the upfront piece really well, the rest of it falls right into place. Right. Well, and, and what you're also talking about though, which would be really interesting to work on, is how does something like this meld with even like 
a design thinking process or approach, which comes from an R&D perspective or what even they're talking about, because there are so many methods and models out there that people are using to do their work. What they don't do is they don't realize that there's a common set of steps. And to me, those common set of steps are around how are we making the decisions and how are we moving yeah. forward? So I could see, how do you meld those two approaches or three approaches together, the ones that you're talking about, design thinking and others, to then say, well, what does it mean? Because until you do that, everybody who's sitting in the room who is going to do things is thinking from their mental model, mm -hmm. right? Am I, am I tracking with you correctly on this? Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, everyone get very bogged down in some of the, what I consider to be the more fun problems, which are the technical problems, because yeah. I have a, yeah. I have a solutions architecture background. Yeah. I love sitting down and designing things all day on the technical side. Technical problems are really fun to tackle, but the harder ones, the more important ones are the ones we're talking about. And I think we get so bogged down in these technical problems. Well, how are we going to deploy it? Or how are we going to monitor it? Okay, that's fine. But we have to talk about the implications of all of those decisions, which is what decisions are we trying to make? What risks are involved in these decisions? Right. That drives everything right. else. Right, exactly. Well, and, and I think to come along with this, the person said, and how do you build a narrative to help open minds to what a strategic model like this can do? Um, I just bring strategic models. I just bring them to meetings. I'm sorry. I don't open minds to it. I just say, does anybody have a set of steps that we need to follow? And it's funny because some people will say, yep, I have this set of steps over here. And somebody will say, but I thought we were using this set of steps over here. And, and then I'm going to say, well, why don't we try to combine them together? See, to me, it's just asking the question, what's the process that we're following? Yeah, and, I, and when we were talking yesterday, you had talked about this persuasion component yeah. of that as well coming into these meetings so number one i'm just trying to wrap some of this stuff up for tactical next steps for people on the call um number one come in with a strategic diagram outline some sort of decisioning framework process that you can work off of so that you have something tactical to to tackle throughout the meeting and the second you mentioned persuasion can you talk about what that means and, and why it's important yeah, um, so Robert Cialdini, who's um, written the most prolifically about influence, and I suggest all of his books, um, wrote a book a few years ago called Persuasion. And what he, he, he gives some really interesting examples in the book, like he was talking about a man who um, shows up at someone's house, I think it was to put in like a fire alarm or a smoke alarm system or alarm, something like that. And um, he says to the people, oh, I forgot something in my car, I need to get it or my truck. Is it okay if I just leave your door ajar as I walk out? So you don't have to answer it. I'll just come right back in. That's a persuasion technique for trust. Because if I trust you to come back into my house and me not having to open the door for you, I will have a higher degree of trust for what you're going to hand me next. It's a very, so there's all of these interesting nuances and techniques that are built on trying to build relationships. But it's um, the most common way we think about it is the meeting before the meeting. That's the most common. But there are lots of other techniques that you can use with people. I mean, what I would do if I were trying to open minds to a strategic model is I'd say, well, who are the people who I'm going to be in the next meeting with that I want to do this with? I'm going to go to them all one on one, one on one and say, hey, do you? and I'm probably going to do it over coffee. I'm not going to even do it in a formal meeting or I'm going to do it outside or I'm going to do a Zoom call with them that's just, hey, just can we have like a chit chat and, you know, have a drink at the end of the day or something like that, because that's where business gets done, quite frankly. Um, and have it be a social conversation where we talk about this. Because that's where you're going to get the most input and the most feedback. And people, then you can say to people, you know, I was noticing that we really don't have a method. I was thinking that this method might work. Might I take you through it? Um, the person might say, I, I don't care to, I don't care to see it. Well, really, that's interesting. Is there something that you're using instead? Yeah, I'm using this. And I've had this happen to me, by the way. I'm using this over here instead. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. I didn't realize that that was your mental model. Can you take me through yours? And then we can see where the gaps, I, I'm in my mind thinking, okay, where are the gaps in theirs? Because as you, as you know, and I know, it's, I'd rather fit into their world and bring them forward then say to them, you need to come into my world 
Because who am I to say you come into my world? I come into yours. I figure out how to help you shape what you got and then move it forward. And then I might say, well, I see, I see something that um, might be able to be enhanced from something we had. How would that feel to you if we brought over something from what I have into yours? That's what those one-on-one -on -one conversations can do. And then you can summarize everything together to say, okay, here's all the input I heard. And you have a very good feel about whether or not there's even gonna be any re receptivity. And maybe even when you get to the next meeting, someone else is saying, hey, you know, didn't you show me something like a couple of weeks ago that we could use here? Versus you having to make that advocacy statement, I've got something we can use. Yeah, it's really interesting too, because I mentioned earlier a conversation I had with a particular CDO, you know, these business owners may not understand what we do and they may be kind of intimidated by that and they may not feel comfortable approaching you. And so you mentioned going into their world, understanding what they do, showing them very tactically and tangibly how we can help them. Um, it reminds me, you know, my family is a, a bunch of scuba divers. We, uh, and when I first started diving, my dad told me a big piece of advice, which was don't fight the water, you will lose. So I, I, and it stuck with me. And even I apply that to business. So it's like, we're, we're talking about trying to change things. We're talking about a lot of change here. And so it's really hard to, to just try to expect people to shift into what you're thinking. And so I think if we can go in and kind of move into the process of what they're already doing and kind of insert what we can do and what we can help into the way that they're already thinking about things, the change is way easier to make because you're already kind of in line with that momentum. Right, and what you're talking about though is not being a subject matter expert as much as you are an internal consultant. And so once again, that's a skill set that I encourage people to develop. What are a set of skills? I used to do this work years ago inside of companies. I'd come in and with people who are statisticians and teach them internal consulting skills, how to better work with their clients from a consulting perspective, because that's what you're doing internally and you're speaking to. But when you come in as the SME, I think this is the best way or here's what you need to do with your data, it's just not gonna go over as well. So I think it's, but, it, but for me, that's what I'm gonna call a design principle. So when I'm setting up, I think we had a question, didn't we have a question about an analytics team? We did, yes. Uh, we actually had a question here. It says, um, if and when is it appropriate to expand from being an individual contributor to assembling some sort of analytics team? Yeah, um, my, my first reaction to that was, um, well, first of all, what's the business case to that? And then second, what, again, what work are you doing in organization design, team design, job design, things like that? Now, what you've been hearing Reagan and me talk about is a preference, what I call a design principle. And the design principle is that we believe that people can be more effective in these roles if they are in service to the business. Not necessarily, even if a group is put together, it's not the group doing the work, it's the group facilitating the work inside of other functions within the business. That's where you're gonna have your greatest traction. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because 30 some years ago, when, this, when analytics work was first coming into organizations as statistics, we went through all of these challenges that everybody here is experiencing. And what we discovered is that people had far more success if they said, how can I serve you best? And they worked from an internal consulting perspective, albeit having frameworks for thinking about things so that everybody knew where we were on the framework, whether it be for problem solving or improvement or design thinking or whatever. Today, it has to do with decision-making because that to me is the global one. So if you're, going, if you're going to be asked to put together a department, this is the perfect time to do an assessment of the organization. And when I talk about doing an assessment of the organization, well, what is business strategy needs gonna be over the next three to five years? You know, What are the work processes and systems that we need to put into our group that are gonna come out like, what's gonna come out of other groups into ours? Um, what are the authority, accountability, responsibility issues around that, right? What sorts of roles might be coming from elsewhere into us? Um, what are we expected to do long-term? 
Like what sorts of outcomes are being expected of us in the next, not the next six months, but the next two to three to four years? How are we gonna help facilitate the business moving forward? Then we can start to talk about what are the best designs for the group? What are the best positions? And then within those positions, what are the best job functions for people to have? But until we have those initial uh, conversations, which are all about requirements, Every that right that's what you I mean it's the same thing over and over all about gathering those requirements up front so that whatever analytics group we create has the ability to be sustainable and we're not coming back six months later saying ah it's not working as well as we thought or oh we didn't hire the right sorts of resources up front because I know for those of you who work in government you know this better than me my gosh you have to like suggest um, or put together the paperwork for a resource a year or more in advance, right? Because the budget process may not allow for it for two to three years. So yeah. that's key. you better have done that assessment. So last time when you heard me talk about organizational architecture assessment, do it, do it yeah. in the design of the department. Make, just don't even tell people what you're doing. Oh, you want me to put together a group? Well, there's an assessment piece that we need to do first. And there are a bunch of questions that I need to ask all of you and then put together your team of people who's gonna help you put together the group. Now, HR might be able to help you because they might have some org design background. Um, if you have somebody in org development, they might be able to help you. Sometimes it's um, there's a person sitting in a strategy group who's done organization design work who can assist, but get a resource in there again to help you out. But you can, when you do this organizational assessment, you will start to get a sense of where the culture is receptive to the work that you're doing and where it's not and the sorts of shifts in thinking that you can make because one of my first questions i'll give you an example one of my first questions takes us all the way back to the beginning of this webinar do you want us to help you improve decision making in the organization or do you only want us to help you with the data that's the input to the process that question in and of itself would be well what's the purpose of our department What's the purpose of the analytics team? If the purpose of the analytics team is to churn out, you know, um, uh, data products um, or work on data strategy or other sorts of things, well, how does that relate to the operations part of the business? See, I think that's what you have to start asking. And if you don't get that clear up front and you just start adding resources, which is what people do, right? Oh my gosh, we need five bodies, get me five bodies. So HR gets you five bodies and you, everybody goes, well, what should we do? Well, no wonder you don't have strategic thinking authority and then talk about it up front. Yeah, I think everyone starts to think about this from the bottom up approach. And we talked about this as well. There's this kind of top down approach and bottom up approach. The bottom up approach is like, what functions do we need to build something, right? Mm -hmm. So we need a data engineer. We need a data scientist. We need an analyst. We need, you know, they think about what does it take to build a solution? as opposed to this top-down approach where you would recognize, okay, here are the job functions we need to fulfill this backlog of decision-making optimization we want to, to build solutions towards. And then it's much easier to say, okay, we're gonna start with these particular lighthouse projects or these particular projects that we're going to optimize that we've realized are gonna be the biggest opportunity for us strategically. We're gonna have the biggest impact. And then for, in order to build solutions for that, we need these types of people in these functions. Well, but and I, I think I'll go back to the step before what you said right up front, which is why do we even think that this is the function of the department? Why is it all about solution building? What, is that really what we're here for? Because I think that you've got to start having those conversations. It's not about our backlog today. See, everybody's thinking about now, today. My words have all been about the future because whatever we're going to put together in a group, by the time we put it together, we're already in the future. What do you need us to do for the business to help it sustain and grow in the future? Yeah, we've got this backlog now. I got that. We'll figure out a way to resource that. You see the, you see the competing demands between today and tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. And I think to your point too, when you're talking about job function, you know, you mentioned business analysts, you mentioned people who need to understand the needs of the business. Like you have to have someone there to do that work. And I think a lot of the times organizations may already have some resources that they think can double for that kind of stuff who don't have the skill sets to do it. I've seen tons of companies demand data scientists to know how to do all of what you are talking about. 
which is not their skill set. No, it's not. Seen statistics. You know, they're really talented at coding potentially. You know, that's not their skill set. And so I think companies need to start thinking about staffing that type of the function as well. Yes, exactly. Well, that's why I'm saying is what what's the purpose of what we're doing and what are our design principles? How do you want this group to function within the organization once it's built? How do you, how do you, you know, write me a story about it? Tell me what life is going to be like in a year when this whole group or two years when this whole group is put together. Tell me how they're going to interact with a variety of different projects and issues with a variety of different solutions that need to be built. Tell me how, because that's going to generate conversation with someone saying, somebody might say, well, that group sounds a lot, a lot like this group over here, which is already in place. <laughs> Someone might say, well, I don't need that group because I've got my own group that I'm building within my own marketing might say this, right? I've got my own group that I'm building within my marketing function to do this work. You see, you start to see some of those challenges that pop up instead of all of a sudden being blindsided or surprised by them. Does that make sense? I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. And so for individuals trying to like start up this function or, or expand it and, and, and grow it, how do you convince your leaders to get in the room and have this conversation that's so critical up front? How do you convince people to spend time with you to get this right? Well, to me, it's <laughs> why would you assume that they would not want this? I mean, I, I, I need to stop you there to say, why would you assume that they would want you to build a group that's going to take a tremendous amount of money out of the budget without putting any thoughtful conversation into it. I think Me. most people, I, I agree with you, um, but I do, I think it always comes down to a way of communicating why that's important to have that, what kind of conversation you need to have in order for this thing to be successful. Because I think, and I've worked with a lot of CEOs on these, and I've had these conversations where they, they're they like, everyone's doing data and analytics. We should set up a data and analytics organization or department uh, or group and go make that happen. So yeah. it, there's, you know, there's a lot of CEOs, that's their answer. And they don't necessarily understand all of the change that comes with doing that. Of course they don't. And they shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. What they want, because I work with these people, they want you to do this. Okay, here are the steps. You want me to put together the group? These are the steps I need to go through to put together the group. And here's what's going to cost, and here's the timeline for doing it. That's all they want to know. Do you have a plan in mind? The challenge I see is that analytics folks are coming at this with no set of steps to how to build out the function. Again, organization design, job design. They're not, they don't have that background. How would they know what the steps are? I teach them in an organization development um, course to MBA students even, and they're like, wow, I didn't know. I didn't know that there's like thousands of books on this and that there's a process to use, right? It's what you don't know that you need to go learn about. So again, finding a resource to help you, but that's all people wanna know is here are the steps. Now, these are steps from one of one of my clients from, from um, who did this work um, a while back. But you know, you gotta just spell them out and then just say, here are the resources I need to do this. These are the sorts of conversations we're gonna have. Here's how long it's gonna take. And when we get to the end of this, you're gonna have a team put together and I'll keep you informed along the way. So to me, it's this knowing this, I guess, versus saying, oh, I don't know how to approach this. If that's gonna be problematic to a business leader when you say that. Cause I yep. would say, are you giving me, are you giving me carte blanche? You know, I, I'll get back to you in a week or two with a set of steps that we can go through to start thinking through this and building it out. Yep. And I want to get to just a couple more questions before we conclude for today, because we've already gone through almost an entire hour, which is crazy, gone so fast. Um, one of them was suggestions on training on internal consulting skills or developing strategic thinking and skills within individuals uh, for services, as, as you described. How do, how do, how does, what are some resources that people can go to to ensure that they've they're they're uh, developing those skills? I'm happy for, to um, give a list of a couple of books and resources to people, but I have learned over the years, and I'm not I'm not trying to sell my services, but I'll just I mean these are things that we've developed with clients 
to use internally, developing these courses and then they can teach them over time because they don't exist. There are courses on strategic thinking for C-suite leaders but not so much for people at the front line of the organization. I've even taught admin assistants strategic thinking skills. Um, I teach a lot of BAs, I teach a lot of PMs, I teach a lot of product managers, I teach a lot of folks in analytics because it doesn't exist. So that's why I mentioned the course that will come up in October in DC and I can, I'm happy to get that information to people. I'm not sponsoring it, sponsored through another um, a company who has a conference. Um, but the internal consulting skills, there are some books that you can pick up and I'm happy to um, suggest some of those to people. If you wanna reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, happy to do so. And I have a then we have one, one more question. Um, who do you think is doing this well today or who have you helped recently to make the shift you're describing or is everyone missing this, this capability? You want my honest answer to that? Mm -hmm. Only honesty, Lori. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not what people wanna hear. Um, there are a lot of people, here's where I see the consulting help happening. Um, I just read about a colleague of mine who put a new consulting firm together to talk about how do I help analytics people with their communication skills. And I see a lot of other people helping folks um, with um, data. I see data literacy in two ways. One is data literacy. How do you individually learn to do data analytics and all the different steps within that, the personal piece of it, teaching you. And then I see folks coming in and saying, well, how do I help you um, uh, within your organization set up a department to do projects? I don't see anybody working at this larger cultural transformation piece. And even when they're setting up the departments, I don't see organization design steps and principles being used. So to me, there's a lot of gaps. Now I've been saying these words and repeating them now for a couple of years. I, we're, I thought we might inch closer this year. I don't know if we will because the number one concern right now is how do we bring people back to the workplace? And, you know, this whole conversation you and I had a little bit yesterday about, oh, you need to come back and work here and you've moved out of state. <laughs> and the number of people who are changing jobs, I mean, even more so between the first webinar we did and this one, I am shocked. I mean, it's not just musical chairs. It's like a free for all, like, let's take everybody off the boat and fill it up with all new people again. When you have that much people change taking place, everything goes back to square one. You can't make the sorts of, you can do all the background work to what you and I are talking about for the transformation piece. That's why I'm saying, if you have the opportunity to put a department in place, stop and be strategic and do the other things that I've talked with you about. You know, talk about, well, why do we need analytics and decision-making in the first place? What's a decision-making mindset or approach that we can use? What's the vision story for putting this in place? Where are our stakeholders now with all of this? How can we do an assessment? Oh, we can say the assessment is for putting together the department, but really the assessment is of the culture of the business. So we can start to shift it. Use this as your anchor. You've got a pr perfect, perfect, perfect opportunity. I think to do the sorts of work that you and I have been talking about these two webinars. You know, and if you're that one individual contributor, you can still do it. You can still do it because all you have to do is change yourself. Go back to our first example. We're in the meeting. Instead of the woman talking about um, decision making, she started to talk about the data and the subjective versus objective or leveraging the data. Had she started to talk about decision making and asking questions about that, that would have been a demonstrative switch in behavior that people would not have anticipated. And they would have listened. They might not have said anything the first time, but if you do it over and over and over again, you can start to make very small sea changes within groups. I've done it and I've seen people do it. You can just be a pioneer in doing this work. And then when you get well, the opportunity to create a department, then you can go forward. Yeah, this is, this is great. And I'm so glad this is recorded. Like I said, everyone can get the reading. I know we're at the top of the hour now. So um, you can connect with Lori on LinkedIn, um, find her Lori Silverman on LinkedIn. Um, and then you can also connect with her in our uh, platform as well. So she's in our platform. So you can go in there and chat with her startup conversations in there as well. Uh, just a couple of announcements. We have our final events um, of this webinar series in two weeks. We're going to be talking about some of these job functions. Um, that do exist in the, in the analytics space today. 
And then um, one last announcement is our in-person conference is coming up in three weeks, which is crazy. Um, so that's in Columbus, Ohio. We still have some tickets left if you're interested in going. I saw Colleen, one of our speakers, is on the webinar today. Colleen, you'll get to hear her speak from Nationwide. So thanks for coming, Colleen. Shout out to you. And thanks again, Lori, for spending another hour with us. We appreciate all of your effort you put into these webinars, connecting with the attendees beforehand, answering their questions, providing your insights. Um, it's just absolutely incredible knowledge that you can bring to the analytics industry and so, so, so needed right now. So thank you so much for your insights and for joining us today. Thank you, I'm very happy to help. All right, hope to see you all in two weeks. Have a great Wednesday.